welcome to Cyber Focus, your source for international business information. I'm your host, Ryan Craven, and our guest today is Professor Shumit Ganguly. Shumit Ganguly is a distinguished professor of political science and holds the Tagore Chair in Indian Cultures and Civilizations at Indiana University. He has been a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C., a visiting fellow at the Center for International Security Cooperation and the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law at Stanford. Professor Ganguly is a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. A specialist on the contemporary politics of South Asia, he is the author, co-author, editor, or coder of over 20 books in the region, which include the Oxford Handbook of India's National Security. He is currently at work on a book that focuses on the origins and evolution of India's defense policy for Columbia University Press, and has recently joined foreign policy as a columnist. Shumit, thank you for joining us today. You know, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, India and kind of their situation with the pandemic and kind of what particular challenges do they face? Initially, uh, the pandemic, when it hit India, uh, was quite limited. It had started out in the southern state of Kerala with a certain number of students coming back from Wuhan uh, who had been studying there. And the state of Kerala did a fairly good job of quarantining the students. And it has a rather well-developed health system by Indian standards. And they moved with some dispatch to uh, 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 limit the spread. And also a number of Keralites who work in the Gulf came back and one or two of them were a bit careless and ignored the warnings at the airport and still went ahead to a wedding, but they still did tracing of these people and the people they had con come into contact with. And so the initial response of the state was fairly good. Despite this effort to contain the virus in Kerala, it did enter other parts of the country, not necessarily from Kerala, but from others flying in from various parts of the world, including China, into the major metropolitan areas. Uh, in March, the government undertook a nationwide two-week crackdown, uh, lockdown, where it basically stopped all commercial activity, told people to be confined to their homes and to um, uh, stop working, and uh, most importantly, um, that they could only go out to get essential commodities like food or water, um, or if necessary, go to a medical practitioner or to a hospital. But beyond that, all activity was ground to a halt from about mid-March. The problem with this was that there are um, about 100 million migrant workers, people who live in different parts of the country and work in other parts of the country. And these people don't have a fixed abode when working elsewhere. They often live in shanty towns. They often live in slums. They often live in makeshift housing near, say, construction sites. These poor people were given four hours notice to go home and all transportation was stopped after four hours. And as a consequence, you had these heartbreaking stories of these poor people walking as much as two to 300 miles home on major highways. Some of them collapsed out of the heat and died. Uh, some were assisted by non-governmental organizations, sometimes by local police, but on occasion, local police treated them brutally saying, why are you walking? You know, you shouldn't be out uh, here. So it was a kind of a patchwork quilt. Uh, there was no uniform nationwide response and no mechanism to take care of the most desperately poor. Yeah, and um, 
I think that's one, I don't see necessarily a common misconception, but something that I'm not super familiar with that I'm learning more about is, is that concept of, you know, of, you know, migrant workers and, and workforces that travel two, three, four hours or more, you know, across country to, to work and then, and then go back home. It's not like they're living and working in the same area or in the same region. No, uh, these are people who often engage in seasonal labor, for example, uh, harvesting crops um, in, in another, in a more wealthy, more prosperous part of the country, or working on a construction project uh, in another part of the country. But they are from villages and more disproportionately from Northern India, which is poorer than Southern India. Southern India is much more prosperous uh, with, uh, with the exception of a small number of pockets in nor uh, Northern India, urban areas. Uh, most rural areas in Northern India are fairly poor and send out substantial numbers of migrant workers to Western and Southern India where there are better prospects for work. And these were the people who were most uh, desperately affected by this abrupt lockdown. You know, it's easy to say, go home, but when your mode of transportation, you know, is cut off in four hours and without any prior notice or planning, it, then this is, this is yeah. the result. Yeah, it was fairly thoughtless on the part of the national government to do this. Um, uh, Middle-class people like myself were not affected. You know, they uh, had enough money to store up stuff, to refrigerate stuff. Um, and uh, they also have people who work for them so they could send those poor people out to do their grocery shopping while protecting themselves. Um, so it, it really fell very hard on the backs of the poor. And especially when, you know, those groups are, you know, make up a, a large chunk of kind of that, that workforce and, and, that, yes. and that, that what needs to get done there. Um, so obviously that has to have had, um, a bit of a negative effect, but, uh, you know, and that, that lockdown happened for, I think you mentioned two weeks. Right. Um, what is it? It was extended like for two more weeks then. Yeah. How is that, how has that situation kind of evolved since that initial lockdown and, and kind of what does that look like now? Yes. The lockdown significantly limited community spread at a dramatic cost, admittedly. But nevertheless, it really limited community spread because people weren't moving. Uh, people were confined to their homes. But now that the lockdown has been lifted about a week or so ago, or at least partially lifted, we are beginning to see a surge of cases and a dramatic rate of doubling of cases. And now India has the unenviable record of being, the, uh, in terms of numbers, not on a per capita basis, but in terms of sheer numbers, the fourth most affected country in the world. Yeah, and it's, I think that's one of the challenges with, with this situation is how fast it can spread, you know, the asymptomatic carriers. Um, and, you know, we're all kind of, adjusting and adapting to that, that situation, you know, ourselves on almost on a daily basis. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, you know, we've seen some of the, you know, the economic challenges um, and impact here, you know, in the U.S. Um, you know, can you share a little bit of light on, on what this has all kind of done for, you know, you know, India's economy? Oh, uh, uh, India's economy virtually ground to a halt in the wake of this uh, lockdown. Um, uh, uh, the the uh, 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 assumption is that uh, the initial IMF estimate was that this year, the Indian economy would grow at about 1%. I think that's a lost cause. I think now India is looking at a major recession where we are looking at negative rates of, uh, of economic growth uh, this year. I think it is going to have devastating consequences. The economy, I think, is going to crater. Now, the Indian government has released a package of $266 billion, or about 10% of 
the Indian GDP to boost the economy. However, this $266 billion figure has come under considerable criticism from a number of independent analysts who argue that much of this $266 spending that the government is claiming as a stimulus was money that was already in the budgetary pipeline. And consequently, it's, that figure is actually smaller. The precise amount is difficult to ascertain, but it is less than what meets the eye. It's not quite $266 billion. I think that is an exaggerated figure, and governments routinely will try to put themselves in the best possible light. Yeah, absolutely. And, and how much of that actually reaches the individuals and organizations that need it is always kind of up for debate. Um, yes, the, that's also an, a very important issue. The government also has indicated that it will provide food to the poorest uh, uh, people in the country. Um, uh, India has what's called a public distribution system by which if you have what's called a ration card, something that's, it's a, a document issued by the government, you can go to what's called a fair price shop and buy uh, essential food grains, cooking oil and the like at highly subsidized prices. Now, uh, people who are poor are eligible for these ration cards. Now, uh, what uh, on the basis of these ration cards, the government has also offered to provide uh, free uh, wheat, rice, and uh, other pulses for a period of three months to these very poor people. But unfortunately, this, this public distribution system is not flawless. And uh, as you correctly pointed out, it will not reach all the intended targets. Yeah, that's always a, you know, again, kind of a, a challenging situation um, across the board. And I think every country is kind of dealing with that in their own own way. Yeah. Um, so, you know, along with kind of along those lines with the negative impact of the economy and, and not seeing that growth, I don't think that's um, unique to India by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but kind of how does how does their role kind of influence you know, trade and kind of that international international stage. Yeah, this it's going to significantly affect both trade and investment um, because uh, of uh, the extraordinary risks associated with the pandemic. Um, and uh, uh, what what has happened is already supply chains have been disrupted uh, because. Uh, some of it was sort of populist anger at China with people suggesting that we should boycott Chinese goods because this is where it's through their carelessness in Wuhan that this originated and now has affected us. Um, and um, uh, also uh, in the midst of all of this, the border tensions between China and India have flared up, which has only fed uh, populist anger, and particularly it, uh, in in the electronic media, where uh, a number of people who are fairly nationalistic have said we should punish China, and already there were security concerns in India about certain kinds of Chinese investment. So um, the government of India had already restricted uh, Chinese investment in certain sectors. Um, and all this is only going to worsen now, especially with the, uh, uh, with the conflict along the border. Um, and oh, of course, it, it, trade uh, well, with other countries are going to suffer because all the major ports are affected in terms of shortage of workers. So you cannot have you know, people operating machinery to load ships, for example. Um, uh, only as of two weeks ago, there has been a partial opening of domestic flights. International flights are still banned. Uh, as a consequence of all of this, 
it's, you know, uh, cargo planes are not flying, uh, let alone passenger aircraft. All this is going to have terrible economic consequences. This is going to be a horrible year for India, along with much of the rest of the world. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the challenges is that, you know, not every area, not every country is really facing this um, at the same time. It's, it's hitting different parts of the world at, at different, in different stages and in different countries are coming out of it um, kind of in a staggered approach or, re, you know, we're sending back into it. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, are there any, any opportunities or, or positive changes that you think might be, kind of come out of this situation? The one positive change might be that India might have to seriously reconsider the 1.9% of its GDP that it spends on, um, uh, on health care, on public health care, uh, which is woefully low. Um, uh, even a country like Brazil uh, spends over 5% of its GDP. Um, China spends uh, uh, an equal, uh, or equal or higher amount. And so India really needs to rethink what it spends on public health care and the public health care system, which is under acute strain right now. And unfortunately, while India has a very good private health care system, people are behaving in the most atrocious fashion, charging unconscionable, unconscionable amounts of money, both for COVID-19 tests and for COVID-19 treatment. Um, uh, a couple of friends of mine have posted pictures on Facebook about rates at major hospitals. Now, these hospitals are comparable <coughs> to world-class facilities, but uh, they are also charging world-class rates, which is inaccessible to close to 90% of the population. And it's easy to say, too, that you know, the, the population that needs those tests also are the ones that are, because they're exposed more, they don't have that opportunity to stay sheltered and even protect themselves. They, they have to go back to work or they have to kind of they don't have their opportunity, like you yeah. said, to, to not but go For out. them, social distancing is a luxury. Uh, they, most people live in extremely dense housing uh, in close quarters. And, they, and while they can practice some social distancing, um, you know, in the summer, people sleep on rooftops and the like. Um, uh, uh, but come this winter, it's going to be exceedingly difficult, and one may well see a second surge. Yeah, kind of speaking to the potential positives, um, you know, I've had some conversations with other colleagues, and um, one hopeful positive that kind of comes out of all of the situation on a global perspective is really reinforcing that, you know, the economy is really a global economy, supply chains. Uh, need to continue to be diversified and, and spread that opportunity, um, you know, across to other countries and other nations. You know, you can't rely on receiving the majority of your goods from China, from India. You kind of need to, to spread that out, and, and hopefully, some of that does will lead to a little bit more of that growth or that recovery. Yes, uh, th that's certainly the case, and in, in India also. There has been a, a great deal of talk about self-reliance on um, not uh, being so integrated into global supply chains and finding uh, uh, ways to uh, boost domestic manufacturing. Um, and also there is a hope that some investment will move from China to India now. Um, uh, the, the pandemic has uh, tarnished China's image to some degree. And consequently, India is hoping to benefit uh, from that. The other positive thing is, I think, I hope people will understand the importance of vaccin vaccination. Um, and once a vaccine is developed, that uh, it, it is something that can actually protect you. And, it can, and vaccination can protect you against uh, and render you immune to any number of possible diseases. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the where the challenges with COVID especially is is that range of for the majority of the people, they they don't know they have it. They might feel a little crummy or you know, the symptoms are so mild that it's not in their the realm of they have COVID, um, you know, versus, you know, the flu or whatnot. And, right. and so it's a little bit less aware that it's an issue. Yeah, I agree. Well, uh, Schumit, thank you so much for uh, sharing your information and knowledge with us. I very much appreciate it. Absolutely. This is a delight talking to you and hope we have occasion to talk on a happier moment. That's it for this edition of Cyber Focus. If you have any suggestions for future topics, please let us know at cyber at indiana.edu.